Hello, today is June 10th, 2008. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Joan Craig. Our cameraman today is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus, and we are privileged to have with us today James, better known as Sam Augustinelli. Welcome, Sam, and thank you for coming. Glad to be here. Can I ask you when and where you were born? I was born in Milford, Massachusetts in 1919, May 18th. And where did you grow up? I grew up in uh, Natick. We did move from Milford to Framingham, but when I was about five years old, we moved to Natick, and I went through all the Natick schools. And did and you graduate from Natick High School? I, I did, the class of 37. What was Natick like back in the 20s and 30s? In the, well, it, there weren't too many Italians around. And uh, it was hard because we spoke Italian in the family and going into school was uh, kind of difficult. But uh, we did pretty good. We converted right away and pretty soon we were all speaking English. Including your parents? Not my mother so much. She was home. My father was out working and m working with the Irish, the English, and the Polack. He had to learn English. What did your dad do? He was a foundry molder and started off in Milford, Framingham. And when he went to Franklin, I was out of high school. I didn't have a job. He took me on as his apprentice. And so I became a molder. That's where I was working when the I was called into the service. So back up a few minutes. You were born in Milford, you grew up in Natick. Yeah. Do you still live in Natick? Yes, I do. So you've lived here practically your whole life. That's right. My father gave me a plot of land next to his home and I built a house there. And that's where I am now. And your marital status? My wife passed away a year and a half ago. And do you have children? I have two children, a boy and a girl. The, the girl is a teacher now and computers and she advanced, and the boy is uh, blind. Was he born blind? No, he was incubated and uh, the oxygen destroyed his eyes. He was a premature baby. Mm -hmm. And it was shortly after that that they found out what was do causing this blindness among premature babies. And he got wonderful treatment mm -hmm. and he has the uh, vision now. Legally, he's legally blind, but he has vision. And he drove a car up until about seven years ago. That's and a couple of accidents has made him change his mind. Sure, <laughs> and, sure. Do you but, have any grandchildren? Oh yes. Mm -hmm. My daughter has two and my son has two. Each has a boy and a girl. Now you mentioned you were, so you graduated from Natick High School in 1937 yeah. and then you went to work with your dad at that Not time? Not right away. Mm -hmm. It was 39. I, jobs were hard to get then. Mm -hmm. And I worked in uh, building the pipeline from South Road to Boston, uh, putting the pipes together and it was a big project at that time. It was a new water supply for the city of Boston. and. There were other jobs. I worked on a farm for a while. Which farm? Do you remember? The Pines in Sherbin. And I worked there. I was working there. And then I got the job at uh, the pipe company. And the pipe company paid uh, $26 a, a, a week. And that was more than my father was getting as a tradesman. So I, I took that job and got off the farm. And then when that, that job was completed, my father got me into the foundry with him. And that's where I was working when I went to war, went in the service. So you're working at the foundry. What year do you remember that you entered the service? I entered the service in uh, March of 1942. I had a, 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 army, a draft number, which everybody in the service received. And uh, it was getting close to the time that I was being inducted into the Army, so I said, heck, I want the Navy. Because I always admired their posters there, join the Navy and see the world. <laughs> and uh, so I went and applied at the Navy, and they says, how do you want to enlist? I said, I want to be on the Res Navy Reserve. He said, we can't take you. 
we're so crowded, we'll take you in as a Navy regular. So I said, what's that mean? He said, well, you have to join for six years. So I figured with the Japanese in Guadalcanal and the Germans all through Africa, this war is going to last at least six years. So I signed up for six years. Wow. That's a long time. It was. I met my wife in the service. Okay, let's and, not get, let's not get ahead of ourselves oh, yet. Okay. okay, so you uh, signed up for six years. Yes. Did you sign up? Did you join from Natick? Well, I went to the frame. They didn't have any uh, uh, Navy recruiting in uh, Natick. I went to the Framingham, and he gave me a, a minor quiz, and he sent me into Boston. That's where I enlisted. Did family or friends enlist at the same time? I tried to get some friends, but uh, they were waiting for their draft numbers to come up, and uh, so I went in alone. And when you were drafted, where were you initially sent? For, uh, did you have I a basic? I volunteered. <laughs> right, but where yeah. did you go? Uh, they sent us to Newport, Rhode Island, where the Naval Training Camp Station was. And uh, we had our basic training there. How long did that last? Do you I remember? think it lasted six weeks. Mm -hmm. and what was it like? Do you remember basic training? I remember very well. There wasn't much doing, and everybody was a recruit. And we had uh, basic marching. It's very minor. The sailors don't march too much, like a soldier. We had that, and we had uh, a lot of sports activity. And we had classes. We had classes in, on rope tying and other things I don't remember too well. And had you ever been out at sea before joining the Navy? No. What do you remember disliking about BASIC? Anything? No. It was a, like a, a camp. Mm -hmm. And everybody in there was... Uh, the same, they had, uh, they were an experience in everything and we banded together and the, the officers were good. And after the six weeks, wh where did you go from there? I went to Norfolk, Virginia, to the Naval Air Station. And the way I got there is when we left boot camp, they took so many A's, they needed so many personnel for the squadron they were forming at that time. They took like A to C, There's so many people they needed. And uh, we went down there, and the, B, the D's and B's went on different ships. And so, so it was on. all according to your last name. That's what it was when we got to, to there. And did, we, you, did you learn anything special, any kind of advanced training in Virginia? Not at 10, I went to an, uh, Technical Training Center in uh, Chicago in, uh, when the war ended, and I went to school there. Okay, but during your time in Norfolk, did you do more training or more? It wasn't so much training. We had a job. We were waiting. For, we were all there, all us enlisted men. We were waiting for the pilots. The ship was still being built, and uh, there, there wasn't much to do but clean the hangar deck and do work at different things, go out on duty. Went to gunnery school in Damn Neck, Virginia. Then we went to a few other school, firefighting school. All getting us prepared for going on ship. So once you finished gunnery and firefighting and your ship was ready, how, how long a period of time was that that well, you were doing all of like that? Like I said, we. In uh, March, when I went in the Navy, six, year, uh, six, six weeks, we went to Norfolk. The ship was commissioned in uh, November of the same year, 1942. The ship was commissioned. We went aboard. Do you know the name of the ship is? It was the USS Sangamon. And how did you spell that? S-A-N-G-A-M-O-N. Sangamon. Yes. And it was commissioned... In, in Newport, New, Newport News, where the shipbuilding yards were. And we went aboard, commissioned it, then we went back to the air station, and we waited for our squadron to develop. Mm -hmm. The pilots were new, green. They 
some of them had never made a carrier landing before. And so we had to go out and uh, they had to qualify to, uh, for landing an aircraft, landing on an aircraft carrier. The carrier was only 500 feet long and the landing space was about 300 feet. And the, the other 200 was to pack the, car, the, pack the planes when they landed. And it was dangerous work. We had a lot of crashes and the pilots were green, but they came along and when they were ready, they qualified, we went to Bermuda. During, during the time that they were qualifying, yes. what were your duties on the carrier? At, well, at that time, I was still a seaman. I was a plane pusher. So when the planes when came plane in, landed, you would push them off? They, went, they, went, they have to cross a barrier, and, pa and, and they're parked there. And when the next one, they put the barrier up, and the next one lands, they lower the barrier and they put it in the forward end of the ship. And, but they don't back up these airplanes. They had to be pushed back to, uh, when the planes are all landed, they're pushed back to the end of the carrier and get ready for the next flight. And so we had chalkmen that chalked them because the sea was rocky and we, we tied them down. They had finger, finger laces al along the carrier where we could put a rope on the sh on the plane and tie it to the sh to the ship, so it wouldn't roll off, it wouldn't roll forward, it wouldn't damage it. And we did that. I packed. After that, I got promoted. I was a second mechanic on one of the planes, which was actually doing nothing. See that the plane was oiled, pull the propeller through for the pilot. And when I'd done that, I'd give him the thumbs up, and he'd kick the engine over, and he's ready to go. When you mention the dangers of trying to land on some mm -hmm. of the carriers, was there any danger to you at times? Well, we, I know where to go. Mm -hmm. You can tell when a plane is going to crash. He's not catching the hooks. They have to catch a hook. And if they don't catch a hook and they land, tips come tip and they come, they're going to come screaming up the deck. So we, I always had a, we all had a spot to jump off the deck and get into the gun tubs uh, there was like passages that went under the flight deck or we could jump in there. And then when the crash was over, we'd come up, we'd have to fight the fire. If there was a fire, pull the pilot out if he was hurt. Was there, did it happen often in the we'd beginning? We'd go a long time without an accident. And bang, we'd have two or three in one day. And we'd have them so bad sometime that we had a ramp with, you couldn't repair them when a, when a plane smashes coming in uh, 90 miles an hour. We just took the plane, threw them over the side, and we had a carrier, plane, uh, uh, a carrier that just carried extra planes. And he, they probably had about 70 or 80. They didn't fly them. When we needed planes, they'd catapult them off and they'd come and land on our ship and we'd be at, at full strength at all times. Like we had 12 fighters, nine dive bombers, and nine torpedo planes. And, uh, that, that, that's very small compared to what the Yorktown carried. They, they carried like 48 fighters and probably 24 dive bombers and torpedoes. They, they were a big ship, a thousand feet long. We were only 500. But we always traveled with groups of four. Groups of four other ships? With the four other ships. Mm -hmm. Like one would be like a carrier for, for us and the other three would, were flyers. Like, like if we were out in a danger zone or something, we, we send off like we'd have the duty that day. We send out our scouts in the morning, and uh, then the next ship would take the next flight out. See that way there, that we we weren't going constantly until there was, until there was an attack. Then we'd send up all the planes. So let's talk about those attacks after your pilots went from being green to being a little more experienced. Yes. Did they then send the carrier out to, uh, the, where when, did you go? Like I said, when we left uh, Norfolk mm -hmm. with the green crew, we went to Bermuda. To Bermuda. And there we were there three weeks and the pilots got their training, their real training, you know. Every day we were flying, they were flying, coming in, and we'd go back and port at night. And then one day, that happened for about three weeks or so. Then one day we went to sea and we uh, 
got in with the biggest armada that was ever formed. That's when they invaded uh, West Africa. There was uh, four carriers, oh, troop ships, destroyers, cruisers, every, every ship available, and transports. Transports. So we went in uh, North Africa. We uh, went to Port Laiati, was where our landing force, where the soldiers landed, and Casablanca. And it was in West Africa. There was very little resistance there. The planes encountered the, the French Air Force that, that went in with the Germans. It wasn't the Free French, but in uh, Africa, they were, I think it was Patain's uh, army. They were, went with the Vichy France. They went with the Germans, and they, were, they gave very little resistance, and the troops got in all right, and uh, we didn't lose a plane. We lost a couple on landings. But we didn't but lose any in, in combat. combat. No, not in combat. We had the pleasure of shooting down a British ship by plane by mistake, and we were all cheering. Oh, why were you well, cheering? Well, we didn't know. We didn't know it was British. Oh, okay. He came over the formation, which he shouldn't have never done. He was a a, a bomber on an anti-sub patrol for trying to protect us from submarines, and. I, I, out of nowhere, one of our planes come, got on his tail and blew him out. And we were there cheering and cheering. Well, we thought it was a German plane. And uh, then the captain says, let me have your attention. That was a British plane that was shot down. We were you able to salvage, pardon? were you able to save any of the members of? The I don't think so. Mm -hmm. We never went after them. When we lost a plane in the water that missed the flight deck and went in, a destroyer always went after them, and to we pick up the every pilot time we else. we uh, in formation when we landed planes we had to leave the formation and and head into the wind, so the planes always landed in into the wind and it made it easier for them because their landing speed was about uh, 87 knots an hour, and uh, the wind resistance slowed them down greatly because they had to come in very slow and catch the barriers. Sometimes they come in and they tore the cable off. And, and that could be dangerous to those of you. It was. One fellow lost his leg on another ship. He did. Because it, it would stretch out about 90 feet and there's a lot of tension on it because it has to stop the plane before it got to the crash barrier. Sure. And one time uh, uh, they were telling me that one broke and it hit the, a wrestling gear man and took his leg off. Now, did the pilots ever have to do night landings on your carriers also? Yes, we had night training uh, on, uh, not the Sagamon, on the Steamer Bay. Now, how long were you on the Sagamon? I was on the Sagamon. I got off uh, November of 43, I believe. 42, 40, I'd say 40. Well, no, you... Yes, and, November of 43? Yes, okay. I November of 43. When you were on the Sagamon, were you in North Africa the whole time? Pardon? Were you up off the coast of North Africa most of the oh, time? Oh, no, we were only there two weeks at the most. Oh, you were? We come back, we hit a hurricane going through the, the, uh, the Azores, I was, that's what it is. It wiped off. The, it curled up the flight deck, and, and it wiped out two gun tubs, one on each side, and water was coming in the ventilators where we were sleeping, and the ventilators were 80 feet in the air right under the flight deck that expanded over the ship, and there was water splashing around, and when we got to Norfolk, Norfolk we went to the air station, the ship went to dry dock, got fixed. When it was ready, we went uh, right through the Panama Canal, what was that like? Oh, beautiful. It was. It, uh, you have to imagine, the, the ship uh, was a, ta a converted tanker, and we only had about a yard on each side of the canal. And you could hear a scrape, and there's a pilot that wasn't attached to the ship. He was with the canal, and he directed us through. And I think he, we went up three locks, and then we had, uh, came to Gatan Lake. That is right in the middle of the Panama. And while we were there, all the banana boats were there. All the natives, it seemed like hundreds of banana boats 
with uh, loaded with bananas, going to wherever they were supposed to go. And then uh, by that time, we got to the other side of the canal, it was dark. So we went to bed, but you, you go down two locks to get even with the Pacific. And uh, I always asked why they had locks to, why didn't they just have a canal and go through the Pacific? Finally, I found out the Pacific, I think, is three or four feet higher than the Atlantic. Yes. And if, if there was no locks, that water would just tear right through there and keep going. Sure. So that was, that was the purpose of the locks. Sure. Now, when you were going through the Panama Canal, did you know where you were headed? Did they tell you in advance? We were going out to the Pacific. Oh, mm -hmm. we knew it, yes. There was only one carrier in the Pacific at that time. I, I forget which one it was. The rest were all uh, sunk by the Japanese. And so when we went there, the three of us went, one, one stood behind, the Shenango. For some reason, it went on sub-duty, sub-patrol in the Atlantic with their planes. But the three of us went through so at different the, times. When then. you say the three of you, one was the Sagamon? The Sagamon, Shenango, and the Santee. Okay. You were all three together? Yes. Like sisters? And then, and then the, the Swanee, I think, joined us later after... Were you concerned about going from fighting the French who had joined German forces to going to fight the Japanese? No. <laughs> I couldn't see uh, nothing. That was, that was like a job. It's like a soldier today where they put him wherever he is and he stays there. One thing, I always felt bad when we were taking the troops in the Guadalcanal. I mean, they, they were already fighting there, but they were replacing troops, supplies. We were covering the transports until they got there and unloaded. Then we'd go back to Fadi in the New Hebrides, where, we, where the squadron was stationed when we went on the ship. And uh, I forget what I was saying. There. Well, you said you weren't concerned, um, that you didn't have any concerns about fighting the no, Japanese, no, it was I, part was, of your job. I know, we'd bring the troops there, they gotta stay there till the battle is won. Mm -hmm. And uh, we would uh, go back to Ifedi, go back to a normal living, taking care of the ship, sending up supplies, bringing more troops, and that, that continued off, I think, for nine months. And then when Guadalcanal was finally ca captured, uh, the Seabees went in and built an airfield. I think the Japs had one, but they improved it and then instead of our ships going up there, supplying coverage and submarine and Japanese planes, or whatever was flying by for, for the, the soldiers' protection, we moved our squadron into the airstrip. And uh, we stood there, and they'd fly there. Instead of flying from the ship to Guadalcanal, they were stationed right there. On the airstrip. On the airstrip, mm -hmm. yes. And, and were you stationed there also? Yeah, we lived in the Quonset hut for a while. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, then we'd go back to the ship, and then the, the whole squadron would go back, and probably another squadron would replace them. I don't, I don't recall, but we left there, and, and that we were there, and the Guadalcanal was captured, and uh, then uh, the next, uh, they went after Tarawa, which was uh, fairly close to the Guadalcanal, I believe, and uh, we invaded that. We didn't know until we had put out to sea and said we're, we're with the invasion force in the Guadalcan uh, Tarawa Island, which was Japanese held, and... And you were headed there? We were there, yeah. We supplied the air support and uh, strafed, bombed all their installations, but one, one tragedy was there. I'm getting emotional. That's all right. Yeah. Take your time. One of the tragedies. The, when the troops went in, the tide went out, and they had to walk about 2,000 yards to get to the beach, and they, they were just mowed down. They were mowed down yeah. by the enemy? Yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And were you on the ship I was on the ship, this? but no, you couldn't see it. We, we, the ship was always back, way back, you know, because the planes can fly over in, in three seconds. But we, we didn't want to get hit by uh, land, land uh, firearms or anything like that. So the, the airship, the destroyers go right in, the cruisers go in, and they bombard the shore, but we bombard it by uh, airplanes. See, they fly off the ship and bomb, 
come back, reload, and go out again. And uh, So you heard about this after it happened? I heard about it. The pilots, the, the Japs laying all over the place. And then the word come around that they were Marines. And How many do you think were lost? Do you know? Over 2,000. And it, 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 uh, I remember the chief telling me, he says, that was the greatest loss the U.S. had suffered in, in a, such a confined area, in, in all the wars. So, but uh, that was hearsay, I don't know. So were the Marines on your ships? No, no, they were in transports, mm -hmm. landing craft. And the transports has a uh, landing craft. Well, they carry them, I think. They lower them over the side and they mm -hmm. lower the Marines in them and they go to the beach and lower the front end of it down and they storm ashore. And so they try to get up as close as they can to the land. Right. In fact, they prefer the land and they run off. But right. they were dropped off between 1,000 and 2,000 feet because the boats were scraping bottom because the tide went out. And Did you ever feel much safer being on a carrier doing the work you were doing versus what some others were doing? The marina sure very much safer. Mm -hmm. But uh, at, at that time, the, it was very safe. The only problem we had was uh, flight deck crashes and they were getting minimal and you know where to go. And, but then after when the kamikazes come, then it, it wasn't that safe. And tell us about that. Were you on your carrier? Were you still on the Sagamon when, when the no, kamikazes? No, after Tarawa, we come back to the States. We went to uh, Dry Dock in uh, California, Mare Island, California. They had a big naval base there, Dry Docks and everything. We went there, had the ship refitted because the ship sort of burns itself out after two years in the in the water, and they replaced the burners and did whatever, changed some of the guns, re replaced the radar, And while that them. was happening, I'm sorry to interrupt, while that was happening, did you have shore duty or did you have some free we time? We had liberty uh, every, every other day. When you're in a safe port, half the ship can go on liberty and the other half stays as a working force. But when you get into uh, Hawaii or dangerous place, you go to a quarter of the ship, if there's liberty, a quarter of the ship can go on and three quarters remain aboard. That and it was, was usually a full day, a couple of days? Well, what no, was it? well depending on the circumstances? Under, under circumstances, you get the weekend off. And uh, in California, we get the weekend off. And then it'd be like every fourth week or something, because every quarter would probably have the weekend off. and. It worked it that way. It was and while you were in dry dock, when you did not have the weekend off, what did you do during the days? Did you help yeah, with we, the ship? We, we scraped the bottom, mm -hmm. <laughs> hung over the side. So they had the you side. helping in oh, dry yes. dock too. Okay. And we, we weren't ship's company. We were the squad. We were Air Force at that time. And we had like our own duties to perform and on the flight deck and we did that but heavy duty when we took on supplies with every division had volunteer so many men and by taking on supplies i mean we take on 500 bags of, of uh, coffee at 100 pounds a bag two uh, 500 pounds of flour and sugar and then at the end they allowed Beer to come aboard. That's when we were at the New Hebrides. And that's the funny part of the story. They allowed beer to come aboard, but we could only drink it when we had a recreation party, see? They'd take so many cases out of storage, and cause so many people, they lost four bottles to a sailor, and they'd put them on the craft with us, and we'd go to the island or the beach, and we'd sit there and drink and swim if you want to. And we were loading them. It, 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 it was very tricky because uh, you got a case of beer, you had to go down three decks so, so to, to the to, storage. Yeah. You got a case of beer, put it in your shoulder, and they checked your name off when you got the can, case of beer, 
And when you dropped it, delivered it at, the, at the three holes down, they checked your name off again. Then you go up and get it. It's like a rotation, a circle. And they would do that to make sure that the, the, your case the, the, got no where case it was, was supposed stolen. to be. And uh, th that went on in rotation. And about three days later, they come around, one case was missing. And what a time they had. They, traced, they had to trace down every carry you made. And, then, and it came that we had a sailmaker aboard. He didn't do nothing because he's a leftover from the sailing days when, they, when there was sailing ships. Mm -hmm. And he had a little cubby hole there. And to deliver the beer going down the deck, we had to go by his cubby hole. And he, that was his office. He dropped the case in there. <laughs> <laughs> and they caught him. They right? did catch him. They, they caught him. I forget what they done to him. They couldn't have done too much. <laughs> now, then you mentioned you went on another ship. Yeah. Was it after you finished uh, dry dock? It, or? Was, it was after Tarawa. Okay. We come back, and uh, we, we were all set to go again. We went from Mare Island to San Diego, picked up supplies. Uh, they picked up a new squadron, tw uh, Squadron 26, well, served their term in the islands, and we picked up uh, VC-90, uh, another squad air squadron that took over, and I didn't, never got to know them because I had a three-day liberty and went to Los Angeles, and when I reported back, I no sooner put my fo foot on the, on the quarter deck and my name was called over the speaker. I report to the personnel officer. I report to the personnel officer. They had the papers. They handed them to me, all my naval records. They said, you're transferred to Astoria, Oregon. I said, how do I get there? That's your problem. I, said, I think they give me fear to get to Astoria. And, uh, now, and you had no inkling ahead of time? No. Was, and, no the, why did they decide, do you think? Why did they decide? Well, as we went along, we send off men to different ships. Actually, we were being considered experienced by then. When the new ship was, was being uh, commissioned, we'd send like two or three ordnance men, two or three catapult men, a couple of directors and a couple of mechanics, and they'd be the nuclear of, of the other ship that was formed. So they told me to, to report to Astoria. They give me the pay, pack your sea bag, and uh, I didn't have any money. I spent it all in L.A. And outside the, on the dock by the gangplank was a telephone. I called up my sister. She was working for K Jewelry in Framingham. I said, you want me to come home for two weeks? She, they gave me two weeks leave. I said, you want me to come home for two weeks? I, she said, yeah. I said, send me $100. <laughs> and I picked it up at the hotel after I had all packed and went to, came to Framingham. How did you get there? Do you remember? Did you fly home? No, I took the train, train then. Mm -hmm. I, I took the train. It was a long trip. It delayed stops all over. Oh, yeah. And then from Framingham, you for, went for, out to for, Oregon? For Framingham, I had to get a... She gave me more money, and I got a, uh, a train ticket to Astoria, Oregon, where the, the squadrons were forming, and uh, sh where we were to meet the new ship, which was being commissioned. And what was that ship? That was a steamer bay. And it was called the USS Steamer uh, USS Bay? USS Steamer Bay. It was a Kaiser-built aircraft carrier. I think Kaiser built about 75 aircraft carriers during the course of the war. And they call them jeeps, Fly, uh, flying coffins, I think, or something. <laughs> but uh, they, they were really jeeps. They were a little faster than the Sangamon, but there's a piece of tin. <laughs> You liked the Sagamon better? No. Okay. No, the Sagamon was strictly military. Okay. Everything is captain's inspections and uh, detailed working parties. And the Sagamon was a younger crew like me. I, in the Sagamon, the seniors were all above me. You know? And when I got in the Sagamon, I was, I was a third class. And I was a plane director. And then there was catapult men there, uh, wrestling gear crew, fire crews. and Was that the Sagamon or the Steamer that's Bay? That's the Steamer Bay. Steamer Bay. They, okay. they, 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 
They were drafted from other ships or training classes and, and sent to, steam, uh, to Astoria to wait for the Steamer Bay to be commissioned. So you were, as you mentioned, more experienced. So now you were, yeah, what, were you, what was your title? Uh, uh, you plane director. Plane director? Yeah, yellow shirt. And uh, what, we got there, we were stationed at the air station waiting for the ship to be commissioned. And when it was commissioned, we went to, I think, at some port where the ship was, and we commissioned the ship. And out of the 500, there was a primary crew there. Only 10% were seaworthy or had experience on other ships. Yeah. And, uh, but I didn't know that at the time. They're all rated, they're all like me. And what we did, we went on a, we went to San Diego, picked up supplies. We didn't pick up a squadron. We, be, we became a, a aircraft carrier, a transport carrier. We transported planes from San Diego. We'd load, load up about 75 or 85 planes, pack them in tight, tie them down, and bring them out to the island. And then when they wanted planes, we had to use the catapult. There's no fly room. And we had a catapult on the left side, and uh, we could fly one plane a minute on the catapult because they had a big tank that had to charge up with air to shoot the plane forward. It actually catapulted it Oh, forward. yeah. They had about 90 feet. And they just, that was my job to bring them to the catapult. And uh, the catapult man put the cables on them. And, uh, and the signal law, he was a pilot, an officer, a flight deck officer. He'd rev them up to 2,800 RPMs, whatever the takeoff flight was, and then we'll shoot them off. And they'd go shooting off, bring another one on. We could launch one about every, every minute. And after a while, we get down to less than 50 seconds. As, that has as to we be get a experience. record. Now, when you mentioned send it, bringing them to the island, what island would that have been? Well, the, f the islands were... Somewhere in the Pacific, Yeah, you we're say. in the yep. Pacific. We were, we were above the Guadalcanal. While I was mm -hmm. in, in uh, Astoria, Oregon, the Marines were capturing different... The Marshall Islands were taken over, and the Gilberts, and there's a, uh, a few more there that I, I can't remember the okay. name. The, the, the Marines were were capturing them. So when I got out there, it was, uh, I think we stopped in Manus Island. And then we got involved in, in I, the invasions are on that slip there that I gave you. It lists, I think, we got five citations for different invasions. And as far as battle scouts, I don't know. I never asked for any, never got any. And uh, that was it. But. But when you talk about the invasions, and you also alluded earlier to once you were on the U.S. Steamer Bay, you were in combat in that the kamikazes. Yes. Talk about that. Tell us about that. Uh, the first time we in the kind of we were invading uh, uh, in the we were in the Lingayen Gulf invading. Uh, uh, not invading, uh, recapturing uh, Manila, I think it was, which is in the Lingayen Gulf. And we're going through the, one of the seas there. There's a thousand islands in the Philippines. And we're all in formation. There's about eight carriers, transports, and destroyers, cruisers. And I'm giving a kid a haircut. <laughs> and all of a sudden, the guns start shooting. And uh, there's a big flash, uh, and then the Omni Bay got hit. And the Omni Bay had just traded places with us for some reason in the formation. They took our place, and they're the ones. And there's only one jet plane, and he comes straight down, straight into it, hit the, hit the elevator, the abandoned ship. 
Uh, they didn't lose too many men, I believe. They did lose some, but the sea was so calm, they all abandoned it. It took about five hours before. In fact, the destroyers had to sink it. Cause and you, did you witness all that? Were you able to see that from where you were? I, I saw the, uh, I saw the anti-aircraft shooting at it, and then the, the flash when it hit the ship. And I didn't know, I didn't even know it. That was the first time I ever heard of a kamikaze. And, and did you realize at that time, or were you told after that they had in fact oh, we changed knew right away. positions? Oh, with no, you? we found out later. I've got the history of the Steamer Bay, and it mentions the, the fact that uh, for some reason, I don't know why, they, they ch uh, changed places with the Omni Bay. Did you feel fortunate in that respect that again you I didn't were... know it right away, mm -hmm. and, and I didn't feel for I said, too bad. I mean, after that first incident, had you witnessed more kamikazes? Yes, the Okinawa had a lot. And were you Iwo in, Jima had them. Were you there? Yes. Talk about those. Those are magnificent, historic <laughs> it's, sites. It's, it's historic, but you're just standing there looking. You're not running a gun. You're just... We're talking about Okinawa. We're, we're talking we're about in Okinawa. We had Iwo flights Jima. up. Yeah. And. Uh, we're getting ready to land them, land the planes. All of a sudden, the Japanese fighter planes and uh, bombers mingled in with them. We had to stop landing, and we, we couldn't shoot because our planes were there. And uh, all we could do was look, and I took cover. The, the, the bridge yelled, take cover, take cover. There was shrapnel flying all over the place. All the ships were, were firing, but it, just seemed uh, like you happened to be there and wasn't excited about it. I remember running under the flight deck and I said, what the heck am I doing here? So I'm back up in the flight deck and, and I watched it. And what, I looked uh, over by the bridge. I'm looking there and there's a Japanese fighter coming in. And the gunner shot him down. He, he hit the water just before reaching the ship. It was that close. It was that close. What, what they were doing is, instead of like the one on the Omni Bay came straight down, what, the, what they were doing now was they were coming in at sea level. So the ships were shooting. They were shooting at one another almost because they had to stop shooting because there were ships all, all beside them and everything. Everyone was so close together. They were so close, yes. So I'm looking at the actions in which the Steamer Bay embarked on during World War II in the Pacific Theater. And it stated that you were with the Southern Palo Palau, Palau yes. Islands, Northern Luzon yes. and Formosa, yes. Lingayen Gulf Landing. Lingayen, that's where we, uh, in the Philippines. That's where we invaded, I think, they took back Manila, Luzon, uh, one of the islands. And, so uh, these, these occurred starting in 1944, the fall, September yes. 44. Boy, for a month in um, 1944, you were in Palau, or outside of Palau. Yes. Uh -huh. And then Formosa and Luzon a few days in October, and then the Philippines almost a month, yes. January and February. Yes. Uh -huh. Was that a constant? Were there ever any calm times, or was it constant battle? Oh, yes. Battle? Yeah, there was calm time. Uh, a lot of it. In fact, uh, I think we went ashore. That was before Luzon. Uh, if we were Mindanao. We were at Mindanao supplying air, air support, and uh, we went ashore with the planes. I remember living, I think it was, it was Mindora, Mindanao or, or Samoa. Uh, Som uh, uh, Sama, I think, is another Philippine island. We were stationed there. Our planes would fly protection from the ground there and while the ship stood out. We stood with our planes. And they, uh, so was that a more relaxing time for you? Well, we lived in Quonset Hut. The planes went out. We serviced them. We, we weren't like soldiers. They were in the battle zone constantly. We always laid back. and We weren't at no front lines for us or nothing. Then it mentions the occupation of Iwo Jima 
from February 15th to March 1945. So were, were you in the thick of it at that point? We were supplying the air protection and uh, our troops, our planes that they're bombing and strafing. That, that, was, that, that was terrible for the Marines and soldiers. There were so many killed and wounded there on the landing. In fact, uh, uh, what my chief was telling me, he, he was getting his information from the officers, you know, and passing it down <laughs> to us. And he says, the first Marines uh, went in uh, Ewell, the Japs let them in. And then when the second wave went in, they opened fire. And they had the uh, first wave sort of trapped in there. and and they were hitting the second wave. But like I say, that's hearsay for me, you know. Actually, it's true statements, but it's what they relaying to me, I, it's, I'm never actually there. So while they were there, were you, was your ship offering support, as All you mentioned? Time, yes. Okay. In fact, uh, we're supplying for the ground troops that are going in, we're sending in smoke planes to and cover their landing. Talk about smoke planes. What, what exactly? The, the Marines were going ashore, and the smoke plane had come almost to sea level and, and lay down a smoke screen so they wouldn't be seen or could get ashore that way. And the chief was telling me, he says, we're sending up a, a TBM for a smoke screen. He says, I feel sorry for him. I said, why is that? He said, the other ships each sent one up and they got shot down. They have to go so slow so the smoke is dense and, uh, and they're, they're, they're a moving target at, at ground level. And none of them come back. We lost, we lost our plane there, the crew. And, and that was the only one we sent. But whether the other ships kept sending them, I don't know. Or they didn't need them anymore, I can't say. But having sent the smoke plane it, it was lost because it, it was got lost, hit. yes. So after the occupation of Okinawa was another one that was, gosh, it looks here like you were there in that area for two months, from March through May of 1945. The Okinawa. Yes, that, that was a long campaign. That, see, uh, Okinawa was a... <coughs> a Japanese island. It wasn't a captured island. This is one of their fortified islands that they fortified from the homeland. And there was strictly all Japanese living there, civilians and all. And, and did you know at the time that civilians were, li were, were living there? No, we didn't. No, we didn't know that. Yeah. And you offered also support then, not only um, the airplanes, going in to support Marines, yes, but yeah. also, did, you, did your ships ever, were, was your USS Steamer Bay. Steamer Bay, was it ever close enough that that would offer fire support to, or was that not your charge to do that? Well, we were close, we could see the island, mm -hmm. because in the, in the sea you could see a long distance, mm -hmm. and uh, we supplied all their air, air support with the other, with the other ships. And, I can't say how long it lasted, but that's where all the, the, the kamikazes come into their own. They were stationed there, and it, was, and it was a very short hop to Japan. Okinawa to Japan was very, clo was very close, and they were flying the kamikaze planes from the homeland. The, the, the Japanese had trained their pilots, kamikaze pilots, to take off, not how to land. So, they had a one-way ticket to wherever they were going. And did you see quite a bit of the destruction that they caused? The plane? The kamikaze? No, mm -hmm. we didn't. Just the few that but you had mentioned? No, we lost a lot of destroyers because the destroyers were in close, bombarding them, see? And the cruisers were in close, a, a steady stream of bombs. Those were the ships they wanted to take out. At first, they, were, they attacked the carriers when we were way out to sea and the destroyers weren't close. But when we, the landing started, the destroyers pulled a, along the shore and they bombed. And, they, and the cruisers did the same thing. Those were the, the ships that, 
that the kamikazes wanted to get out of they there. They were the ones that and got hit And they sunk hard. a lot. They, I think that I heard say at one time that they lost more sailors at Okinawa than uh, soldiers. Because when the ship went down, probably four or five hundred men were run, I see. So, but that was like hearsay. In them. Do you remember when you mentioned losing some of your pilots, did you ever get close to any of the pilots or was your job just so entrenched in moving the planes and... and oh, well, well, we don't move the planes until they land. I can remember one, pi one pilot, he missed a barrier and when he missed a barrier, the, the propeller tangles around the crash barrier. The crash barrier are thick cables and there's three sets of them, rows of them, one, two, three, and he's gonna stop. So he didn't catch a barrier but there's release tension on it, so it's not a sudden stop. When he hits the, the barrier, and he'll probably go ahead about 20 feet, and his prop wraps around the, the barrier cable, and the plane flips over. I remember running under there, the pilot is in there upside down, and he's got his safety belt on. I pull it, dropped him, and we pull him out, and then the fire crews come and stand by in case there's a fire. And everybody was trained on what to do. And so you basically saved this pilot's life. Well, he was knocked unconscious. And uh, the next thing they fear is like a fire, because that, uh, you know, a ruptured gasoline tank. So the fire crew jumps out right away. And they, they, they were well organized, the fire crew. They had uh, three types of, uh, they fought with CO2 bottles, they had fog. Uh, if you've never heard of it, it's such a fine mist that it, it bars the heat from coming at you. And it's like a fan spray. And you go behind it and get to the plane and do whatever you have to do. So it allowed the, them to get closer yes, to the plane. As, as close as they can. Without getting yes, burned. Yeah, the, the fog. And then we had the regular spray noggles. There's three methods of fighting the, the now, fire. Now, did you have to get involved in that too when necessary? No. No, they had, they had their men. When we went to flight quarters, the general quarters, that was their duty to, to, to perform that mm -hmm. duty there. So they were expert at that They were particular. good at it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> During this period of time, which is now a number of years, were you ever feeling like you'd never get home? Or, I mean, you were out well, at sea for an extended period. Between this, I think the, the steamer bay pulled the, the Sangamon, pulled into Hawaii a few times. We had liberty there, mm -hmm. and we'd go down Honolulu, like, we'd have a good time. And then we'd come back. The first time we went to Mayor Island, the second time we went to uh, San Diego. That's when I got transferred. Mm -hmm. And the, the Steamer Bay come in to, to San Diego, and we had liberty there, and we were going back and forth. There's always work that had to be done on the, sh on the ship. The boilers had to be done, or new radar was installed, and stuff like that. So between them, the Sangamon and that, I could come back to the States four times, but we wouldn't stay long until the repairs were performed, and then we'd go back out. And Now, when when you were in the midst of some of these missions with regards to the, the uh, Pacific, did you realize at that time the historic piece to all of this? Or were you just, as you had mentioned earlier, doing your job and then after the fact? You, I was you just doing a job, mm -hmm. it, it seems. And like I said, Guadalcanal, I think that, that campaign lasted about a year and a half or maybe a year. I don't remember. And, and there we are, just a few miles away from Australia. I said, this war will never end. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it, it would have ended if it wasn't for the atomic bomb. God. Now, you were in the service when that occurred. Yes, I'll tell you right where I was. <laughs> where were I you? I was in dry dock at San Diego getting refitted to go back out in the Pacific, and I'm standing on the flight deck, and uh, all the ships, the horns, the whistles are blowing, and they come running around, the war is over, the war is over. Then I found out it was the atomic bomb was dropped, 
And I, and I said to myself, the war is over. Here it is, 1945, and I don't get out till 48. Now what do I do now? Now what are you going to do? <laughs> so what I did is the next day, I went down uh, uh, to personnel. And I said, I've been at sea for about three years or so, and uh, I'd like some land duty now. The war is over. He said, I can't do that. So I walked away, and there's my commander uh, up on the flight deck. And I went up to him, and I said, Paul, commander, I said, I've been at sea uh, three years, and I'd like to have some shore duty. He said, where do you want to go? Uh, well, uh, Chicago. I want to go to propeller school, aviation propeller school. Go ahead. He let you go. A couple of days later, I packed my sea bag, took a uh, week's fill low, went home, come back home, and then went to Chicago and went to school there as an aviation propeller mechanic. Before going to Chicago, talk a little bit about, you mentioned going to your commander. What was your sense about the officers and their leadership? Do you think your officers Well, at that been... time, uh, you looked at it as an officer, uh, uh, as a man above you. But then now, and, and then after I looked back, that officer didn't have the experience I did. He was a recruit. They were building ships so fast, and they were getting them out of... Uh, college and making them all incense. Oh, there's a ton of them. And so knowing that, did they depend upon you a they, lot? They did, but they put it in such a way that you didn't realize that they were, they were dependent on you. They, they'd say, uh, well, we got to spot uh, uh, six planes for, uh, for a flight. And they'd tell me to arrange it, you know. That was in the Steamer Bay on the, on the Sangamon. There were others above me that had more authority, they'd take charge of it. And uh, one day, we were in the steamer bay, we were out in the Pacific, and uh, the officer come up to me, he says, wait, we were in trouble. I said, what's the matter? He says, we gotta take, there's a wreck on one of the other carriers, and we have to take on a few of their planes. Where are we gonna put them? I said, let's go to the Ouija board. He said, what's that? Uh, on one of the passageways, there was a, a mock, mock carrier, the same size as ours, and everything was scaled down. The planes were that big, and the, and the model was probably uh, two yards long, and you could get those planes and move them in a position where they wouldn't hurt one another. You could store so many there and fold the wings and put so many there. And so we arranged it so we could put Pack them in such a such a way that we could land them planes and still keep ours aboard. <laughs> they didn't even know it. He didn't know about the no, Ouija board. No, we were using it all the time in the Sangamon. Sure. But this ship, they, they didn't know. But you can't blame them. To, so you were able to take the additional sh uh, planes yeah, on. Yeah, we thought, oh sure. We put so many in the hangar deck. When you're landing them, you got two ha two elevators, one where they're landing and one foot of the barrier. So when they when they land and you don't have any, much more room on the parking forward, you put them on the elevator, lower them, and put them in the hangar, the very big hangar. And we were doing that, and we, oh, we were, had great speed. We were parking them, you could go around the side of the elevator and park them forward of it, and in the meantime, you could be putting two in the elevator and bringing them in the hangar. One day, we're putting two in the elevator, the elevator's going down, you look up, there's a plane hanging over your head. He caught the barrier. <laughs> and the barriers are close to the elevator. There he was hanging over us. And the captain said, no more, no more work in the elevator when the planes are landing. <laughs> sure. Because if you ever went down the elevator and caught fire, there'd be heck to pay. It would have gotten yeah. in, in, inside. Well, it would have probably and, destroyed the ship with a hangar deck fire. Along and the flight deck is pretty, you know, you can fight it easier in the open, but the hangar deck, all the gas lines and other planes are there. And, and personnel also. Yeah, they have personnel there. Mm -hmm. yeah, they, they had, a, like, we were the V1 division. We were the flight deck. 
V2 was the hangar deck crew. They worked the hangar deck. V3 was photography, aerographers, and so that's why I got those pictures from the era, from the photographers. I was very friendly with them. Mm -hmm. yeah. So once you were able to get off the ship and have duty on land, you said you went to Chicago. Chicago Aviation Propeller School. And how a, long were you there for? It was a twelve-week course, and. I can say I learned very, very little because the war was over and all the instructors were civilians and as fast as we'd go from one classroom, they were being discharged. And what they were doing was taking graduates from the class and making them instructors. And they didn't have the knowledge that, uh, that the others did. And, so I learned very little, to be truthful, and when I got, I thought I'd get another ship when I get back, when I finished the 12 weeks, and they finished the 12 weeks, they sent me to Memphis, Tennessee, to a naval air station. It was a technical training center, and I was supposed to be an instructor, which knew very little about propellers, and, and we were having students giving class, and in fact, when they made me an instructor, they didn't make me a propeller instructor, they made me an engine change instructor. Taking the engine off the plane and have it where it could be serviced and replacing it with another engine if it had to be. And that you did know how to do. No. You didn't know how to do that. <laughs> no. I didn't know how. I learned with the you students. Learned, so you had to learn and I then I learned instruct. with the students. Mm -hmm. and, and while I was in Memphis, I met my wife. Talk about that because uh, you mentioned yeah. your wife. Uh, you think I'm cougar when I finish this. Uh, I had uh, broken my arm. How did that happen? In a fight. Okay, you want to talk about that? The fight was between us on the station and the discharges. We were at the, at the canteen drinking. And we met outside. And I hit somebody and I broke my hand right here, and uh, I had it passed, I had it in the sling, and I went ashore while that was on, and uh, walking around, this army corporal, a female, which was my wife, she said, poor little sailor broke his arm, and what happened? And that started a conversation, and uh, we kept a couple days, We'd go over to the, there was two of us. We'd go over to the Kennedy Hospital, uh, I forget, and where she was a technical sergeant, a corporal, I'm sorry, uh, working in the operating room. Was We'd she go, a nurse by trade? No, she wasn't a nurse. Mm -hmm. she, was something, she went to school for it in the Army. Mm -hmm. She didn't learn too much either. But, <laughs> <laughs> but this she was, and we'd go over there. She'd come to the base. We went back and forth, and then the Hotel Peabody had a, a, a lounge strictly for servicemen. Peabody is the big bear, the big hotel in Memphis, mm -hmm. and uh, they had a, uh, a man out there checking IDs, and we'd go there a lot, and all my buddies would be there, and she'd have five or six of her whack, for, her whack friends would be there, and you know, go to movies, and go to the fairgrounds, and, Love a normal life, and one day we were at the the, bar, Memphis, the ballroom in Memphis. I said the Sky Room or something. I forget the name of it. And we're dancing and we're laughing. I, I asked, "Will you marry me?" <laughs> she said, "Yes," <laughs> and we got married. In and, Tennessee? No, Mississippi. Is that where she was from? No, oh. we never went home. We just. Married, I got my two sailor friends, the best men. She had a t t two uh, army uh, corporals, I think they were, that were stationed with her. And we went to Hernando, Mississippi and got married. And you could get married there and just see an I do, go down. And, 
And it lasted 61 years. I, I think it was a good match if it lasted yeah. 61 years. Yeah, she years. was a kook. <laughs> Where was she from? She was from Brooklyn. That, that explains it. Brooklyn, New York? Brooklyn, New York, mm -hmm. yeah. So what you're, now you're a married naval, what was your rank at that point? I was a second class aviation machinist mate. And so did you get quarters to live together, uh, uh, married quarters? Or? Uh, being a second class, I, I was allowed $40 a month for outside living, for rental, and uh, I lost my eating privileges at the, at the base because I was living outside the base. I lost that, and uh, we rented a, a, we rented a room with a family, a nice lady, and we stood there, and then I got a, a, a trailer on the base. And they, they had about 20 or 30 trailers there. They, they were trying to help us out. Well, first, they converted the barracks into a living quarters, and there was like families living there, all sailors and their wives. Excuse me. And uh, it was rough living. We had to bring your water in, but I had some friends that were plumbers. They, went under the barracks, they connected to it, and we made a sink out of stainless steel, and we, they had no trap. Every time the water on, bloop, 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 and, and, and we had to get out of there, and we got a trailer right on the base, and we lived in the trailer, then one day they says, pack up, you're going to... No, my wife got, my wife got sick, very, very sick. And when I, uh, she had a, a, an ectopic pregnancy. It's very painful, it, I understand. It's very, mm -hmm. and she had it for some while before they, they figured out what it was. And, and what, she was at the Naval Hospital. <coughs> there was a Navy hospital right there. <coughs> and she went to the hospital. They gave me a week off to stay with her. They were very good. And when she got better, we, we found another apartment in the city, and then we got that, that's when we got the trailer after the apartment. And while we were there, uh, I got orders to transfer to Jacksonville, Florida. And could she go with you? Oh, she could go with me. But what were we gonna do? They didn't give me no money. They didn't, uh, I had to find a place in Florida. We stood at a hotel there for a week and because uh, I had to, they gave me a week off before I reported to the base. And uh, we were there, what are we going to do? So she called up a sister in Brooklyn and said, My husband's got a, a month, two more months or a month to go before his, his uh, enlistment's up. Can I stay there? She said, Sure. And the sister said, Sure. And she lived with her sister. In, in Brooklyn. Brooklyn. Yeah, and she got a job there. I forget what it was. It su supported herself, and I stood up at uh, Jacksonville for about another two months. And what and were you doing on a daily basis in Jacksonville? Just about nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, the war was over. They had a surplus of officers, and uh, the, the women were opening up life, lifeboats that, that the ships, car the planes carried, those seaplanes, and uh, they'd open them up every year and redo them, put new CO2 bottles in there so they'd expand. They did that and I just stood there. Overseeing it? More what or did less? I know? I just yeah. stood there with them. They had to put me someplace. Sure. And I, that's where I was and then I, I, from there I got discharged. So you were discharged from Jacksonville, Jacksonville Florida? Jacksonville, Florida. Two months ahead of time. I got discharged the 1st of January. As I went in uh, the 1st of March, so I did like five years and eight months of, five years and 10 months of duty. So was that in 1948 at that point? Yes, it was January 1948 I was discharged. Were you glad to get out? Oh yes, I was married. And what was your rank at that point? Did you Aviation say? machinist made second class. That'd be the, the equivalent to a staff sergeant in the army. And then 
were you going to come back to Natick, did you think, or were you going to go to Brooklyn at that point? Well, I stood in Brooklyn, picked up my wife, and we went back to Natick, and uh, my sister put us up for a while, and I got an apartment at my brother's house, and I stood there. For, I got a job at General Motors, and I stood at my brother's. Then we had an Italian club down the street, and there's an apartment upstairs, and they needed a manager. And it was a very small club, about 150 members. So I became the manager, and I lived there till I built my house. What were your feelings about coming home? I confused. There I am with a wife. No, no place really that I could say there was my own to go to. I had to be accepted at home. Well, they would do it anyway, but you feel like you're imposing coming in with a, with a wife. And my father was living in there, and my brother was there. It's made it difficult for them. But they accepted your wife? Oh, they accepted us, yep. When you came home, did you discuss with your wife, your family or friends, what you had been through and done in the service? Did you talk about no. the war? Well, see, the war was over so long. I'm in January of 48 now, and all of the boys that were there, that uh, they were all discharged, they were all working. The, the war was nothing. The war was over. It, it isn't that I just come home, the, the, the war had ended, and I come home, uh, a war hero or anything, they're all there at the depot and none of that. Right. <laughs> no. But so you kind of had to just pick up where you left off almost. I tried to. I, I, my father got me back and they had to take me back in the foundry because if you were drafted or went in the military and that job was open, you, you got it back. And so I, did you work in the foundry for a while before you went to GM? Yeah, I worked in the foundry, yes, before mm -hmm. I went there. They had to pay me a, a full molder's rate, even though I wasn't, uh, I was an apprentice when I left. The, the government made them, pa they added my service time to my apprenticeship time, and the molder's time, uh, takes four years to be a molder, and uh, so with the six years credited in the service, plus the two years I worked in the foundry, they had to give me a molder's rating and pay. Did you join any military reserve when you came back? Uh, I did. My, a friend of mine, a, a, a wave of was friends with, with my wife, lived, lived with us and good friends with us. She, her husband, her father was commander of the E.P. Clark Post in Natick, mm -hmm. and they were having a drive, and he talked to, my, to me and he got me and my wife to join. And we stood in it not too long. He he was no more, uh, no longer a commander there, and uh, so I just dropped out. Mm -hmm. And uh, while I was out, I was working at GM, and a friend of mine who was recruiting for the VFW. Mm -hmm. He was on me every day. I finally joined, and I wouldn't be in it now. But after I became 70 years of age, they made me a lifetime member. So you're now a so lifetime? So I'm now a lifetime member, and I drop in every time, but I'm not active in any of their affairs. Did you receive, or have you received, any veterans benefits, such as hospitalization, GI Bill, or insurance? Uh, well, like I said, the benefits was, they made the difference from an apprentice molder okay. To, mm -hmm. to, a, to a journeyman's pay. There's like a oh, $1.50 difference. See? Do you and attend the, any reunions of your old outfit, your old group? Pardon? Do you attend any reunions? With oh, your, I did, yes. When but, did you do that uh, and where? Uh, I went to the Steamer Bay reunion in Providence, Rhode Island. and. It was today, I think, like three days. I, took, I went with my daughter. How long ago, do you remember? Oh, I'd say 70 years. Did you recognize any old friends? No. Oh, okay. 
Oh, yes, I recognized the catapult officer. You did? <laughs> he was checking in the same time I was. And I says, Ensign Berg? She says, How do you know me? I said, You're my catapult officer. <laughs> so we talked, but he, he seemed upper class then. He went on, he was a commander at, at discharge. I, he stood aboard ship, and where he went after that, I don't know. I think he, he served his 20 years. He came out of command out. Wow. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. How important do you think serving in the military was for you? I can't say. I really can't say. It was just like another phase in my life. It was going like from one job to another. I mean, I, I never traded in on their education. And I don't think I qualified it. Yeah. Do you feel in any way it affected your life? No, it didn't affect my life at all. It didn't, uh, you see a lot come out there, needed medical attention. There's quite a few of them. Of course, they probably endured a lot more, stuff like that. But. And speaking of medical attention, did you ever have any hearing issues or anything like that you were in? an atmosphere where it had to be very loud with the planes coming in and going out? No, I never did. I belonged mm -hmm. to the heart study and they checked me out mm -hmm. with a real fine method they have. It's not like they could have uh, three different sounds coming in and I'd have to identify them and I'd pass them very well. Looking back on it all, do you have any most memorable experiences or memorable characters or humorous experiences you want to share with us? The, 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 the one, one ended in a tragedy, but uh, we had this kid, and he was a good kid. He's a second class aviation machinist, maybe. And, and, uh, he, he was the one that's the center of attraction all the time. And he always wanted to get transferred. He, from one ship to another, he made a few ships, and, and he was, we weren't the, the, the fantail of the ship. And, and hey, he's crowing, he wanted to get this job. He wanted a, a transfer to another ship. And just then, a, a, the officer of personnel come walking by, he, somebody said, if you want to transfer, ask him. And he went, hey, you want to transfer? He fell off the ship and he drowned. Oh my. Yeah, that's the tragedy part, but he, he was humorous. Uh, and Were you there when that happened? No, I had walked out, but I was there while it was, while I was there, I walked in, I went into the hangar and one of the boys come running laughing, he says, I don't. I won't mention the name. Fell off the fantail, and uh, oh, he was laughing. They, they, I guess they figured they'd pick him up, but f from the fantail, they have to signal the bridge. The bridge signaled the destroyer. That's probably out of quite of a mile. They had to turn around, and when they got to him, he was going down. Oh, yeah. so he did pass yeah. away. Uh huh. And. As we finish up, is there any thought incident or something you'd like to say, any kind of additional comments to share with your family who will be viewing this tape or others who will also be viewing it? Anything you want, you'd like no, to say? I no, don't, I don't want them to review it. <laughs> it's maybe for future history, but grandchildren's grandchildren, they, they can, because they, they always have to research doing that and school work and mm -hmm. tracing down because I got a letter from uh, uh, one of the pilots that was shot down over Guadalcanal. His name was uh, Winstead and I, I received from uh, some Navy meeting they had. He wrote, he wrote uh, what would you call it, uh, the history of, of his uh, his uncle, I think it was. Oh, it was, it was he was the grandson, I think, of, uh, of, Winston, uh, of Winstead. And, and he, he wrote it and they sent it to me. So something like that, if people research in the future, but otherwise. 
I won't even tell my parents I'm here, and my, my brothers and sisters. Do you want to have any other additional comments to finish up this interview? No, I can't think of any, no. Well, James, Sam, Augustinelli, yeah, yeah. we want to thank you for sharing your story well, with us. It is well, actually a remarkable story. Thank you for thank coming you, in thank today. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. You're welcome. Yeah. Thanks again.